Thank you for joining us for The Love of Wisdom with Alan Watts in a talk from our second radio series on Zen. Through his books and public lectures, Alan Watts introduced millions of people in the West to Eastern thought. Today's program was recorded in the mid-1960s on the ferry boat Vallejo. It comes from a seminar on early Chinese Zen. Here's Alan Watts. So, if, if these are not precepts. This is not telling you what to do. This is an attempt to describe how it feels to have realized the mind, to be a Buddha. Everything feels unobstructed. I have a friend who's a psychiatrist who, when he was a young man, in medic uh, just before he went to medical school, had one of these Satori experiences for no reason whatever. They can just hit you. And uh, he told me it lasted through a whole summer and that he felt no obstructions in any direction. He went around with bare feet and he felt no inclination to shrink from the ground. You know how it is if you're not used to going around with bare feet, you walk delicately like Agag in the Bible. Uh, you know, you, you sort of shrink from the gravel. Well, he just relaxed. He felt absolutely conformable to the ground. And all his natural functions, his appetite, his uh, alimentary system and everything just went beautifully because he wasn't putting up any defenses to life. There was no obstruction in any direction. I once had a dream about this. I was, uh, found myself in a gymnasium sort of room, huge room, uh, and at one, about half the room was filled with tables that were all stacked together like card tables, and chairs were piled on top of them, almost up to the ceiling. And I was standing shoulder to shoulder with about uh, four or five Zen monks. <coughs> and uh, there was a Buddha figure up on the wall, and we all put our hands together and bowed. The monk next to me turned his head slightly towards me and said, from now on, anything goes. And the game was to move into that mass of tables and chairs and get through them. And the rule of the game was, whenever you saw an opening, move into it without hesitation. Never stop to think. Never choose. Just go. And we had the most glorious time worming in and out of these things, you know, and it seems so easy. Well, uh, many things are like that, you see. If you don't block, then, as it, as it were, in a manner of speaking, you aren't there. Now, don't take any of this literally. I mean, if, when people start taking this kind of thing literally, they get into all sorts of weird theories about the non-existence of matter or... Uh, they get all fouled up about the nervous system or something like that. All this thing is a way of describing how it feels. If I say, walking on air, never a care, something is making me sing, tra-la-la-la, tra-la-la-la, like a little bird in spring, I don't mean literally I'm walking on air. If somebody says, oh, king, live forever, they don't mean that they really wanted to live forever and ever, poor king. Uh, so uh, all kinds of literatures, Bibles and so on, are full of these metaphorical ways of talking. And they, the trouble we got into when those ridiculous Roman lawyers like Tertullian started taking it all literally. And, and we never recovered from it. It's like I was saying yesterday about the argument I had with a man about how long a kalpa is. It doesn't make any difference. Uh, so, you know, in, in the Japanese national anthem says, May our emperor reign a thousand years, reign ten thousand thousand years, till little stones grow into mighty rocks, thick velveted with ancient moss. Well, obviously nobody means it. They mean have a good long life. Uh, we like you and we, you're faithful subjects. But uh, <laughs> you exaggerate. It's, it's funny to exaggerate. It's a kind of a, an extravagant compliment. So all these ways of talking must not be taken uh, as if they were meant 
to be the kind of speech which a scientist uses. See, a scientist uses a peculiar kind of speech, which very few human beings ever have used or do use. He uses the utmost precision of language. He tries to get language to be as exact as numbers. But we don't use that language in the ordinary way. And so all those idiots who go and study the Great Pyramid and measure it and try and get scientific prophecies about the future of the world or read the book of Revelation and try and figure out how many years it's going to be until the end of the world, all that is completely beside the point. The total misunderstanding of the nature of these documents. So in, in just that way, uh, when it said that the mind is empty and is space, this is simply a description of a certain way of feeling. Now, let me give other illustrations of this. Supposing you wake up with a hangover. You feel your head is extremely large. Of course, you look in the mirror and it's just normal size head. Or you uh, get sensations like singing in your ear. But if somebody goes up and listens to your ear, he won't hear any singing. Or there was a wonderful um, comic strip incident in the Corky comic strip a long time ago where this boy, Corky, sees a plane passing over. And he's very interested in planes. And the comic strip shows his neck getting longer and longer as he's following this. And then it finally ties itself into a knot. <laughs> but that's what it feels like. But of course, that isn't how it is from the standpoint of an objective scientific observer. So in the same way about one's mind being space. You mustn't take this literally in such a way as to deny all that we know about neurology. All the neurological stuff remains intact. Although if you start thinking about neurology, you get into some pretty far out situations because uh, you, you start getting into physics, the physics of the nervous system, and all these Are they particles or are they waves, wavicles, with vast spaces between them? We just never seem to be able to get rid of being space. It so lands up that uh, the ultimate constitution of matter seems to be a set of points in space, a set of limits in space, uh, where something is going on which is very dif difficult indeed to differentiate from the space itself. Some people believe that what things are, you know, where you run into something hard, like a rock or a person, that what has happened there at space has become more dense. Uh, there are very weird theories about this going on. They're very serious ones, too. But uh, this is a, a way of talking, as I say, to describe a certain kind of subjective feeling of not being blocked. Now, let me... Uh, illustrate a little further uh, how Hui Nang deals with this. Let's see. 17. Now, be patient with this. I'll explain it. Some of it's a little technical. In this method of mine, from the very beginning, whether in the sudden enlightenment or gradual enlightenment tradition, no thought has been instituted as the main doctrine. No, um, I would translate this thingness, has been instituted as the substance and no attachment as the foundation. What is no thingness? No thingness means to be free from things while in the midst of them. No thought means not to be carried away by thought while one is in the process of thought. No attachment is your original nature. That's the transparent space, you see. Thought after thought goes on. It's like this. 
the great uh, Japanese master Dogen says, spring does not become summer, nor does summer become autumn. There is spring, and then there is summer, and then there is autumn. He also says, spring is color, because when the hills become green, that is the same thing as spring. Now, uh, this is based on a very curious idea. You who sit in these chairs are not at all the same people who came in at the door. Because everything has changed since then. In that same way, the spring does not become the summer. There is your state at coming in at the door, and then later, sitting in the chair. Now, if you insist on the idea that you sitting in the chair are the same people who came in at the door, you are being reincarnated. That's the real meaning of reincarnation in Buddhism. Is saying, I was, I am, and I will be and getting anxious about it, instead of living just this moment. Because if you were, then you carry all your past karma, all the blame can be put on you for all the bad things you've done. If you insist on you that you will be, then you get anxious about dying. Now the perfectly free creatures like these sparrows have no thought about dying at all. They don't know they will die, so they don't worry about it. So they have no problem. If they do die, slam, that's that. But so they hop about and they have all sorts of amusing things to do. Um, and you know, they don't, they, they're not absolutely tormented with eating because uh, they don't eat all the time. I watch them. They sometimes just sit, they play, they quarrel, they jump around, but they just don't uh, linked together past, present, and future. Man, as Korzybski pointed out, is a time binder. He links the past, present, and the future together, and that enables him to play certain games that other creatures can't play. But you can do that without getting stuck. The trouble is, you see, if you get stuck as a result of time binding, all it does is make you anxious. You pay the price of anxiety for everything you gain by it. Yes, you shall have this power. You shall have this technology. But you will pay for it with the poison of anxiety through the whole thing. So one must realize that the constructions we make of past, present, and future, the continuities we describe as our biography, our history, these are all illusory. illusory but interesting illusions. Don't be taken in by it. See that fundamentally there is this moment and there isn't anything else. Where is the past? Produce it. Where is the sound of last night's champagne cork going pop? No, no, we can create the illusion that the past is real by recording it and playing it back. We do it on the TV, we do it in our heads. It's the same trick. Where's the future? Where is tomorrow morning uh, San Francisco Chronicle? There is only now. And once you get to see that, you are, you are liberated. The, I quote uh, again from the Huynan, he puts it very beautifully. In this moment, there is nothing which comes to be. In this moment, there is nothing which ceases to be. Thus, there is no birth and death to be brought to an end. Birth and death means, is in Sanskrit, samsara, it's the term the Buddhists use for the rat race of existence. Wherefore, the absolute tranquility of nirvana is this present moment. Though it is at this moment, there is no limit to this moment. And herein, 
is eternal delight. Now, I want to emphasize one other aspect of Huenang's teaching. It, it, it will be a clue for you to understand these Zen stories. And this is his theory of opposites. Uh, in giving final instructions to his students, he said, whenever anybody asks you a question about sacred matters, answer in terms of the profane. When anybody asks you about profane matters, answer in terms of the sacred. When they ask you about Buddha, answer about ordinary people. When they ask you about heaven, answer about earth. When they ask you about life and death, talk to them about nirvana. When they ask about nirvana, talk to them about life and death. When they ask you about profound metaphysical matters, answer in terms of common things and vice versa, always. Because this is the meaning of the middle way. Buddhism is called the middle way. And uh, it, it works in a, in a dialectical principle. In other words, the Buddha taught that life is basically suffering. Not because that was a dogma that should be believed in by everybody, but to counteract the view that life could be or ought to be pleasurable. He taught that we have no abiding self to counteract the view that there is a sort of psychological pit in the prune that is always you and that reincarnates from prune to prune, body to body. Uh, the famous quotation I love from R. H. Blythe when he was asked, do you believe in God? He replied, if you do, I don't. If you don't, I do. <laughs> this is the way it works. So therefore, when a Zen master is asked, why did Bodhidharma come to China? In other words, what on earth did this man come and make all this fuss about called Zen? Why did he have this Zen? Why does he want to tell us about it? The answer is, will you please pass me the toothpicks? <laughs> the, the, some of these stories are difficult to tell without simply adapting them into our idiom. Uh, for example, we don't have a thing called a zenpan, which is a chin rest that you use uh, when you're meditating for a long time and you get tired of holding your head up. So you have this chin rest. So once uh, a monk asked, uh, tell me, why did Bodhidharma come to China? And the monk said, pass me the chin rest. The master said this, and the monk passed him the chin rest, and the master hit him with it. <laughs> uh, you know, what is that one thing which will continue when at the end of the Kalpa, all the worlds have been burned up? Answer, a sesame bun. <laughs> now then, on the other hand, when... Uh, a monk talks in the worldly terms, they're, you know, they're eating, and he says to the master, pass me the knife. The master passes it to him blade first. He says, please give me the other end. The master says, what would you do with the other end? See, he suddenly starts making a weird puzzle out of a very ordinary everyday event. Enlightenment and nirvana are like hitching posts for a donkey. There is no place in Buddhism for using effort. Just be ordinary and nothing special. Relieve your bowels, pass water, put on your clothes and eat food. When you're tired, go and lie down. Ignorant people may laugh at me, but the wise will understand. 
As you go from place to place, if you regard each place as your own home, they will all be genuine. For when circumstances come, you must not try to change them. Thus, your usual habits of feeling, which make karma, um, destiny for the five hells, will of themselves become the great ocean of liberation. Outside the mind, there is no method. And inside also, there is nothing to be grasped. What is it that you seek? You are saying all around that there is a way to be practiced and put to the proof. Don't be mistaken. If there is anyone who can practice it, this is entirely karma making for the bondage of birth and death. You talk about being perfectly disciplined in your six senses and in the 10,000 ways of conduct. But I see it all. But as I see it, all this is creating bondage. To seek the Buddha and to seek the method is precisely making karma for the hells. Now, that's Rinzai. And he says uh, elsewhere that when somebody seeks the Tao, the way, he automatically loses it. So all this, uh, this, this method of those ancient Chinese masters was to put their students in a dilemma. And this created, very naturally, the situation of the koan. Today, the koan is created unnaturally. You give someone a koan, you see, and he goes off and thinks he must meditate on it. And he does his meditation. But in the old days, there was no need to do that because they got the people so confused by these ways of talking that they were meditating naturally. And they didn't have to say, I'll meditate for five hours beginning at uh, eight o'clock in the morning or whatever it was. They were in meditation all the time because they were so bugged by these answers. And what they used to do was they went out and walked in the hills and traveled from monastery to monastery trying to get a master who would solve their dilemma. I must get it, but there is no way of getting it. I want to give up myself, but every time I intend to do so, it's a selfish intention. That sort of thing. So those monks used to go from master to master and pester them with questions and try and get at the point what it was all about. And every time they got to one of them, the master tied him up in an even worse knot than he was in the first place. And so the secret always is, as I told you yesterday, the whole of metaphysics may be comprehended by understanding that an inside implies an outside and an outside implies an inside. And that what that really means is that the inside and the outside are basically one and at the same time different. So when you can see everything in this world, all its differences, as identical differences, things are one just because they're different. And so it turns out that when anybody understands the unity of things, they become different. It makes you more of an individual than you were before. And so there's a Zen saying, mountain gets the mountain and the water gets the water. That's literal translation. But what it means is something like this. A mountain is so much like a mountain and water is so much like water. And it is most Everything is most like itself when it realizes the basic unity. I find that people who study Zen become more and more like themselves. And they let go of this passion 
to get one up on the universe, to know the truth, to find God, you see. That's why in the end, the highest religion is in a way irreligion. It's getting rid of God and uh, Nirvana and Bodhi and Buddhas and all that thing. And you see that all that is simply a way of trying to solace yourself for the disappearance of your ego. And that the more solace you have, the more terror you have. When on the other hand, uh, you, you completely get rid of religion and throw all that stuff out. I mean, I mean it's, it's like religion is a form of, of it's been called the opium of the people. And then it is. Uh, get rid of the whole thing. And suddenly with a jolt, you realize that that's what all those religious people were talking about. That's what Buddha, Jesus, everybody was talking about. Only, there's no other way to find it than your own way. You find out by yourself. Alan Watts from the Alan Watts radio series number 8 on Zen. For information on how to obtain the radio series on cassette tape, call 1-800-969-2887. Or you can write to the Electronic University, P.O. Box 2309, San Anselmo, California, 94979. When you call or write, please indicate the name of your local station that you heard a selection from the Alan Watts radio series number 8 on Zen. Again, the phone number is 1-800-969-2887. That's 1-800-W-O-WATTS. The Love of Wisdom with Alan Watts is produced by the Electronic University. Our theme music is by Zakir Hussain, courtesy of Moment Records. I'm Neil Harvey. Thank you for listening. <laughs>